In this video, we're gonna be going over the history of raiding from Vanilla WoW all the way to Shadowlands and everything in between. Starting off with the launch of Vanilla WoW where there was two raids immediately, both out on November 23rd, 2004, Anixia's Lair and Molten Core. And at the moment, raids were 40 man only, requiring a full 40 man raid to combat the forces of evil. Both had their own attunements, Molten Core only a single quest, with Onyxia being a massive quest line. However, Onyxia went down first, surprisingly enough. 69 days after launch, it was killed for the first time. And Ragnaros was killed 154 days after launch. Within the caverns of Molten Core laid three legendaries, a special necklace that dropped for one single person before being removed, as well as the parts to craft two far less unique but still awesome legendaries, the Sulphurous Hammer of Ragnaros, and a Thunder Fury Blessblade of the Windseeker. Two months later, Blackwing Lair released, July 12th. Another attunement, but much shorter this time. However, it would not be cleared until after Zul'Gurub, first 20-man raid in the game. Introduced in September 13, 2005, which was cleared the day of its release. Within its walls, a Raptor and Tiger Mounts randomly dropped from their bosses, followed by Blackwing Lair finally being cleared 13 days later on September 26, 2005. Three months later, the lands of Silithus would be transformed forever. The Temple of Ankaraj would become, well, unlocked. Players then needed to work together to unlock the raid by performing massive quest lines and ringing the gong as a scarab's lord to then battle the forces of the old gods for 10 hours. And then the temple would be attacked, first off with the ruins of Ankaraj. The 20-man raid Smaller Wing would be cleared first day of openings of the gates on the 23rd of January 2006. However, Cthune, at the end of the temple, the 40-man wing of the raid, would not go down for three months, on the 25th of April in 2006. Within its chittering caverns, the red, blue, green, and yellow Karaji battle tanks were obtainable. These special mounts were only usable inside the raid, though. And now, for the final raid of Vanilla, and the final ever 40-man raid to be added to the game, the legendary Naxxaramas, opening on June 20th, 2006. Players would exchange materials less and less based on the reputation levels with the Argent Crusade in order to gain access to the raid. And well, how long did it take? A massive 90 days for Kel'Thuzad to finally fall to the hands of Nihilum. On September 7th, followed not too long after by the release of the Burning Crusade, only four months later in January of 2007. So not many guilds had the chance to down the place, especially with the announcement of the expansion Resetting Player's Progress. Many players simply quit, or did not bother to raid, knowing their progress would end up basically pointless. However, within this raid, players were able to gather the pieces to then craft the legendary Atiesh, limited to Druid, Mage, Warlock, and Priest, although a slightly different version of the same staff for each class. The Burning Crusade launched with many raids as compared to most other expansions. At release, on the same day of January 16, was Gruul's Lair, Magtheridon's Lair, Serpentrite Caverns, Tempest Keep, Karazhan, and the Battle for Mount Hyjal. Karazhan, the longest of the launch raids, was the first to go down. With only 10 players allowed in the raid, it was killed only 12 days after the launch of the expansion, in January 28, 2007, with the raid dropping his mount midnight from Atum rarely. The remaining raids of TBC would mostly be 25-man. Blizzard moving away from the 40-man raid style, favoring a new 25-man system, although with the odd 10-man here and there. Gruul's Lair was killed 19 days after the launch of the expansion, with him dying on the 2nd of February. Magtheridon went down after 40 days on the 24th of February in 2007, and was one of the longest raid fights in the game's history. Serpent Shrine, however, as its attunement required, was long and time-consuming, and the raid actually having more than one or two bosses, it did not fall until the 29th of March. 73 days after launch, in big part to the last boss being extremely buggy. Now into the Tempest Keep, the Eye. This raid's final boss, Kalthas, was a very unique boss fight, with the players looting temporary legendary gear mid-fight to use for the remainder of the fight, these items being the Cosmic Infuser, Devastation, Nether Stand Bow, and to fire from the Nether Spikes, Phase Shift Bulwark, Warp Slicer, and the Staff of Disintegration. However, even with all these legendaries, the fight was deemed unkillable because of his very buggy nature and would not be until the Black Temple was released, which was on the 22nd of May, fixing many of the bugs on Kel'Thas, meaning he was finally killed 130 days after launch of the raid, on May 25th, 2007, having a chance to drop his Phoenix Mount Alar. And with his death, players could finally enter Mount Hyjal, which, while available since launch, it is hard to count it as such since it was locked behind killing Kel'Thas. So its Days to Kill is counted from Black Temple's launch, 
However, even though this raid was quote-unquote available since launch, and much smaller than Black Temple, it would not be the first to be cleared. Illidan was such a fan favorite that players rushed to kill the legendary Demon Hunter. Black Temple was cleared 21 days from its launch, within its walls dropping the legendary Warglaze from Illidan Stormrage himself, followed by Mount Hydril being killed 26 days later. Zulamon was then released and cleared on the day of November 13, 2007, the second 10-man raid of TBC, and the last ever 10-man only raid of WoW. However, this raid had a special event. If complete within a specific amount of time, the players could loot the Amani Warbear, which was removed come Wrath of the Lich King, not wanting it to become too easy to get. Following that, the last raid of the Burning Crusade, and the last ever 25-man only raid ever, would be open. The Sunwell Plateau on March 25, 2008 with a legendary Thoradel bow dropping from the final boss kill Jaden, which was forced back through the portal for the first time on May 25th, 2008, exactly one year after his minion Kel'thas was killed in the Tempest Keep. Wrath of the Lich King released November 13th, 2008, introducing a new raiding system, and with this raid could be done in 10-man groups or 25-man groups, the 25-man raids having slightly better gear than the 10-man versions, usually being seen as the superior version, of course. So, world first kills will only be counted for 25-man. The expansion launched with the Vault of Archivon, a remastered Naxxramas, Obsidian Sanctum, and Eye of Eternity. It would not take long at all, with Naxxramas and the Eye of Eternity and the Vault of Archivon all being cleared in only two days on November 15th. The Eye of Eternity containing the Azure Drake and the Blue Drake, while the Vault of Archivon contained the three-person mount, the Grand Black War Mammoth, a blue one for Alliance and red for Horde. Part of the reason these were killed so quickly was because gear from Sunwell Plateau was still pretty good in early Wrath of the Lich King. This was something they fixed later on in expansions, where previous gear from previous expansions were no longer good enough to be good during entry-level raids. The other raid, Sartharion Three Drakes, taking until the 21st of November to die. Sartharion is a dragon within a single room. Besides him is three smaller dragon mini-bosses that need to be killed before engaging him. However, if the raid pulled the boss and killed him without killing the dragons, they would join in on the fight. And if the boss was then killed, a special achievement and bonus loot including a dragon mount would pop up. The Black Drake in 10-man and the Twilight Drake in 25-man. Next was Ulduar, releasing April 14th, 2009, containing the legendary Mace of Aldir, with the raid also making the most use of the hard mode mechanic compared to any other raid in the game's history. We have a whole video on these if you want to learn more about them, but I'll go over them quickly here. By doing something specific during or before the fight, the raid can activate a harder version of that fight, which would just make the fight harder, giving extra special loot for killing the boss in that matter, and also sometimes extra bosses, Algalon the Observer requiring the players to kill a few of the bosses in hard mode to unlock. However, the biggest achievement was killing Yogg Saron without the help of any of the Keepers. Quite the difficult feat, as the fight is very obviously designed around the Keepers helping you with the fight, which was known as Yogg Saron Plus Zero or Yogg Saron Zero Lights. It took players 85 days to kill the Mouthy Clan with no lights, all the way to July 7, 2009. Dropping the Mimiron's head mount, guaranteed to drop one per kill, at least until the Cataclysm pre-patch where it became a random drop. In the very next raid, they introduced some new mechanics, the Heroic Mode. These versions of the raid gave even stronger loot while also just being harder. And to pair, they added a limited attempt counter. While in Heroic, any wipes would count that counter, and if you ran out of attempts, you would need to wait till the next week to be able to try again. With the Trial of the Crusader even having a special achievement for killing the entire raid without a single wipe. Rewarding the players with a unique Crusader horse in 25-man, or a horse slash wolf for 10-man depending on your faction. All retired with the Cataclysm's launch. So with the Trial of the Grand Crusader launching on August 4th, 2009, its Heroic would have been cleared soon, except for the fact that its Heroic mode did not actually open until September 1st, 2009, almost a month later, finally letting players attempt Heroic versions of the raid. So how long did it take? Well, around seven days, with the new Barak going down September 7th, followed shortly after by the return of Anixia. Blizzard, in celebration of five years of WoW, brought back the legendary dragon in a new 10-slash-25-man version that was killed the exact same day she came out on September 22nd, having a chance to drop the Anixia Drake, a mount version of the dragon herself. Outside of Anixia's lair, every raid after Trial of the Grand Crusader would follow the same system of normal-slash-heroic 10-slash-25-man modes. Ice Crown Citadel, 
where players crafted the legendary Shadow Marn after a long, raid-wide questline to combat the legendary Frostmourne wielded by Arthas the Lich King. Releasing in December 2009 on the 8th, it would take a while to clear the raid, as the raid needed to be cleared on normal before it could be cleared on heroic, and with the raid having a massive time gate of releasing a new wing every couple of weeks, heroic mode would not open until two months after the launch of Ice Crown on the 9th of February. Finally able to enter the raid on Heroic, it took players 46 days to finally put the Lich King himself down, on March 26, 2010, dropping the infamous Invisible Mount Invincible, a guaranteed drop once per kill, at least until the Cataclysm prepatch. And just over a month later, the raid Ruby Sanctum, a single boss raid getting players ready story-wise for the Cataclysm would release and be killed the same day on June 30th. Now, before we move on from Wrath of the Lich King, we must talk about achievements. With their introduction, many raid fights would get simple achievements for killing bosses. However, from now on, any raids added would get new special achievements. These achievements are gifted for doing unique things during a fight, with various challenges, some making fights harder, some not really being anything other than doing the fight really well. But completing these achievements usually gave nothing but a bit of achievement points to show off to your friends. However, there was one thing. Meta achievements. By completing all of the special achievements for a raid, you would be granted a special mount. For example, completing all of the special achievements for all of the bosses in Old War 10 Man would give you the Rusted Protodrake mount, while 25 Man would give you the Ironbound Protodrake. The same style reward was in the remastered Naxxramas, giving the Plagued and Black Protodrake. However, they were made unobtainable come Old War's launch, something they decided to stop doing after this, as it seemingly did not go over well, as the Old War mounts and all those meta achievement mounts to follow would stay obtainable. So for those that have meta achievement mounts, we will list them in the video. For example, Ice Crown Citadel had the Undead Frost Drake mounts. December 7th, 2010. The Cataclysm would release with some raid changes. First off, the limited attempt mechanic was removed, and the rest of the changes would come later. With the launch, there was three raids, Bastion of Twilight, Blackwing Descent, and the Throne of Four Winds. Blackwing Descent would be the first to be cleared on January 9th, 27 days after a launch. Bastion of Twilight would be next on the 20th of January 2011, 38 days after launch, the first ever raid to have a heroic only boss. In normal, the final boss is Cho'Gall, however in heroic mode, players would be pitted against the new heroic only boss, Sinestra. This kill was followed shortly after by the Throne of Four Winds at 42 days, this raid having a chance to drop the Drake of the South Wind Mount, and doing the meta achievement for all three of these raids, the players would be gifted the Drake of the East Wind Mount. Baird and Hold was also in at lunch and was meant as a replacement for world bosses, locked behind PvP world zones and a new boss added with each new patch, all just like the Vault of Archivon. Cleared day of, of course. The next raid to come out would be Firelands on June 28th, containing our Fire Lord Ragnaros once again. It also, after completing a long questline for it, the Dragon Rat Staff, a staff which had a unique effect that allowed you to transform into a Dragonfly mount which you still need to have the staff equipped in order to do that as they didn't turn it into a toy or something for players that were able to obtain it. The Lord of Fire Ragnaros himself would not be killed once and for all until July 19th, 2011, only 14 days after its launch. The raid had two mounts it could drop, the Pure Blood Firehawk from Ragnaros, which is a guaranteed drop if killed on heroic mode before the Mist of Pandaria prepatch, and the Flame Talon of Alice Razor, which was a rare drop from the Alice Razor fight followed by the Corrupted Firehawk gifted to players for completing the Glory of the Firelands Raider meta achievement. And now for the big one, Dragon Soul, releasing November 29th and containing the Twin Blades of the Dragon Prince, a rather cool pair of daggers for rogues crafted with the help of Rathion, the son of Deathwing. And this raid contained a ton of mounts, first the Twilight Harbringer given to players who did the raid's meta achievement, and three mount drops, the Lifebinder's Handmaiden from Heroic Deathwing, guaranteed one drop per kill until Mr. Pandaria prepatch the Blazewing Drake randomly from Norik and Heroic Deathwing, and Experiment 12B randomly from Ultraxion. And enough about the good parts, let's talk about some of the issues. First off, the raid was seen as rather poor, with some awkward boss fights and some right out horrible ones. It didn't take long to die though, dying December 20th only 14 days after launch. And yeah, the dates do not add up, 20th of December is not 14 days after the 29th of November, but again that's because players needed to unlock Heroic first. So the first way they did normal to then unlock Heroic Week 2. So that is where it and others are counted from. But the real problem was LFR, a new difficulty mode introduced in the game. This mode was very easy and quite time-gated, with its wings coming out week by week. 
later nerfed to a new wing every two weeks. It also gave weaker gear than normal, but the problem was that it gave the tier set bonuses, and could be combined with other difficulty tier set bonuses versions in order to get the 2 and 4 set. And the tier set bonuses in Dragon Soul were some of the strongest in the game's history. And there was this little old exploit you could do in LFR, where you could only personally loot the bosses once a week. However, other people in the raid could trade you gear as long as you participated in the fight. So, top raiders were stacking LFR with alts and just having them win the rolls and trade all their gear to the main raiders, giving them all a full four set bonus as soon as Heroic started. And so many top guilds were banned because of this, and also because of this, Blizzard nerfed LFR heavily in the following expansions, not wanting high-end players to feel they needed to do LFR, or especially that they needed to exploit it. Oh, and also, meta achievements could not be completed in LFR, so you could do them only in normal Heroic, but it was best to do them in normal, as that was the easiest way to make sure you can get them done. With the downfall of Deathwing, we enter Pandaria, September 25th, 2012. For the first time ever, the raids were not available at launch, giving players time to level before releasing the raids. Not wanting to worry as much about leveling being a major part of the world first race. And so, the first raid, Mogushan's Vault, was released on October 2nd. And so, week one, of course, normal raid was cleared, which leads to week two, the heroic final boss only dying three days after it became available, dying on October 12th, 2012. Within this raid was Elegon, a Celestial Cloud Serpent that dropped a Celestial Cloud Serpent mount, of course. Following that, the Heart of Fear would release on October 30th, 2012, with yet again another short race. Week 1 normal clear, week 2 heroic being cleared in only 5 days on November 11th. Terrace of Endless Spring would be released on November 13th, then being cleared in 5 days once heroic became available, the Shot of Fear falling on November 25th. Completing the meta achievements for all these raids granted the players the Heavenly Crimson Cloud Serpent, However, also clearing all the raid bosses in Heroic as a guild unlocked the Thundering Jade Cloud Serpent Mount, to be purgeable from the guild's vendor for 3,000 gold. And then on March 5th, we would be gifted with the amazing raid, Throne of Thunder, with yet again another Heroic-only final boss, that being Raw Dead, and the return of the limited attempt system. The raid was called completed 14 days after Heroic opened on March 26, but then Raw Den was taken out afterwards by a fair bit too not dying until April 11th, 2013, taking over two weeks. And for completing this raid's meta achievement, they were rewarded with the Armored Sky Screamer. But for killing the bosses in the raid, you had two mounts you could obtain as rare drops, the Spawn of Horridon from Horridon and the Clutch of Jikun from Jikun. Now into the Siege of Orgamar, launching September 10th, it only took 14 days after Heroic Unlocked to kill Garrosh on the 1st of October, although 11 of the 14 bosses in the raid died in only the first two days meaning the other 12 days was spent on the last three bosses of the raid. The meta achievement gave the Spawn of Galacrass mount, and the Corcoran Juggernaut mount a guaranteed drop from the hardest difficulty of Garrosh, changed with the Warlords of Draenor pre-patched for a random drop in the hardest difficulty. But we're not done yet, Siege of Orgrimmar introduced a few new systems. First off, the Ahead of the Curve achievement. This achievement was granted the players who killed Garrosh in normal mode or better before the release of Warlords of Draenor pre-patch. This achievement granted players the Corcoran Warwolf, which meant once Warlords of Draenor pre-patch came out, the mount was no longer available. The other thing was the flex mode. Easier than normal, but harder than LFR. This version of the raid could be done in any amount of players from 10 to 30, scaling the difficulty of the bosses to better suit your raid, meaning you no longer had the issue of having 20 players and either pugging, not raiding, or splitting into two 10-man groups. This would not last long though, as the final change is the one that came in the pre-patch for Warlords of Draenor. They reworked all of the raid difficulties, LFR stayed the same actually, but Flax was renamed to Normal and stayed the same. Normal was renamed to Heroic, and now it worked the same way as Flax did, but just as a harder difficulty. While Heroic was renamed to Mythic, this difficulty was rather unchanged, staying the hardest mode, and staying a static number of rating. However, Mythic rating was limited to 20 people meaning no more 25-man raiding and no more 10-man raiding in the hardest difficulty. If you wanted to do the hardest content, you had to have 20 people. No more, no less. However, with all of the other difficulties, as long as you had more than 10 players and less than 30, you could raid, and that is a system that would stay to this very day. Before we move on, I'm sure you noticed a lack of legendaries? Well, from now on, mostly legendaries would be earned through all sorts of content, parts to do with raids, but mostly just earned all over the place. World content, questing, crafting, and even PvP. But raids were not the main focus of where you obtained the legendaries anymore. 
especially as legendaries were no longer something a couple few would get. They were now something every single person was pretty much guaranteed to get as long as they completed their own quest lines with their personal loot. No longer having to fight against fellow raiders for random raid drops to craft their legendaries or roll for rare drops. Now onto Warlords of Draenor, releasing November 13th, High Maul in his first raid was released December 2nd, with Mythic not releasing until the 9th. As like Heroic of the Past, Mythic would not open until a week after the raid's launch. And so with Mythic launching the 9th of December, the final boss, Imperator Margok, was killed only four days later, on the 13th of December 2014. The second raid of the expansion, Blackrock Foundry, releasing February 3rd, 2015, and the legendary fight Blackhand would survive only 10 days, dying on the 20th of February. This raid was a return to glory, being well known as the best raid of the expansion, especially with such an amazing fight as Blackhand. Completing both of these raids while in a guild unlocked the Blacksteel Battleboar, while completing the meta achievement version of the fights granted everyone the Gore Strider Gronling. And for mount drops? The Iron Hoof Destroyer, a massive clef hoof coated with burning wood and metal, dropping on Mythic only as a random drop. And now onto the final raid for Draenor. Yeah, that was quick. Hellfire Citadel, launching June 23rd, with Archimonde dying 16 days after the Mythic version of the raid opening. This place has three mounts. First off, the Infernal Direwolf for the meta achievement. Second off, the Grove Warden for the Ahead of the Curve achievement mount, which was removed in the preparation for Legion. And the Felsteel Annihilator dropping from Mythic Archimonde. Again, a guarantee dropped until it was lowered to 1% come the next expansion. Now, on to Legion's final invasion of Azeroth with Legion. Launching August 30th, its first raid Emerald Nightmare would not be released until many weeks later on September 20th. And how long did it take for its mythic final boss to go down? 18 hours. Most world first raid groups got to Cenarius, the second to last boss, and assuming Xavius would be really difficult, they moved to Heroic to do more farm and collect more gear to help them. But the winners, Exorus, said F it, and instead decided to give it a shot and, well, it died really quick, and was snatched away from Midwinter and Easy, who were on the task to get it. According to some World First Raiders, a reason Xavius went down so fast was because of Mythic Plus gear being so good at the start of the expansion. Because it was then when that system was released for the first time, and they hadn't figured out how to not make the gear super good for Mythic raiding yet. The next Raid Trial of Valor came out November 8th, and took only three days after Mythic Unlocked to die, and died on the 18th of November 2016. And while the raid did not drop anything super special, it did have a special achievement. If you completed the raid without having a single death, during all three of the fights in one single clear, you would get a unique color of the raid's gear set. A quite unique reward that was removed with the BFA prepatch. January 18th, 2017, the Night Hole, still part of Tier 1. This raid took a fair while to clear for once, 11 days and a massive 248 attempts for Gul'dan to finally drop on the 4th of February. Illidan was free and with that, a couple of mounts too. For the meta achievement, the Grove Defiler and for random drops, the Fellblaze and the Hellfire Infernals. Both dropped from Gul'dan, but the Fellblaze Infernal dropped from any difficulty of Gul'dan, except for the first week of the boss fight being on Raidfinder where the Infernal could drop as a bug. But the Hellfire Infernal acted as a 100% mount from Gul'dan from killing him on Mythic, again being reduced to 1% come the BFA prepatch. With how powerful players got by the end of Legion, and how long they had to farm this mount, it ended up with a green version available in all difficulties being more rare than the red one. As at least the red was a guaranteed drop, while the green seemingly had less than a 1% chance to drop. Our next raid was the Tomb of Sargeras, releasing June 20th. The final boss being yet again another demon lord we beat before, Kill Jaden. This fight was well known for how horrible it was. 654 wipes to take down, it required most of the raid to race change the goblins in order to use rocket jump to counter one of the boss's mechanics. And also, with a heavy RNG in the fight, it took quite the toll on players. Fun fact, he died two years exactly after Archimon did on July 16th, 2017. The raid's meta achievement did not give a special mount, it only gave a title and pet. Rather lame for non-pet battlers, but at least it had the Abyssal Worm mount which dropped from Mistress Sazim. And the final raid of Legion was Antora's The Burning Throne, released November 28th, 2017. The final boss, Argus the Unmaker, would survive a whole 8 days, dying on December 13th. This raid also contained a special legendary. There were epic trinkets that players could obtain, being based on the Titans. However, Argus himself had a chance to drop a legendary trinket. This trinket having an extremely rare chance to drop. Some guilds killing Argus multiple times every week they could would never see this trinket with just how rare it was. Quite odd, but it was quite powerful. 
at least for some specs that is. Mount-wise, there was four of them, the Antorn Gloomhound earned from the meta achievement, and its twin brother, both based on the twin hounds boss of the raid, the Antorn Charhound, which was a rare drop from those specific bosses. Sadly, putting these mounts side by side does not make them bigger like the bosses do when they're near each other. And once again, we were given a mythic-only final boss mount, that being the Shackled Urzul. An amazing mount at that. Sick and twisted, it was a 100% chance to drop when killed on mythic. But with the BMA pre-patch, it was dropped to 1%. And for the Ahead of the Curve achievement, we had the Violet Spellwing. This mount was gained by gathering a Blood of the Titan from Heroic or Higher Argus the Unmaker, and then turning it into Khadgar. Like other Ahead of the Curve achievement mounts, it was made unavailable come the pre-patch for the next expansion. Now to BFA, the last complete expansion at the time of this video, releasing August 14th, 2018. Its first raid, Old Deer, would release September 11th, 2018, with its final boss, Cahoon, dropping dead on the 19th of September, only living 8 days. While no mounts dropped in the raid, completing its meta achievement gave the players the glory of the Old Deer Raider and the Blood Gorge Crack. Next, we have the Battle for Dazara Lore, one of the most unique raids in many years. First off, it had different bosses based on your faction, while Trial of the Grand Crusader had different bosses based on factions visually, and so did Ice Crown Citadel with the loot ship being the opposite faction. This one had three different bosses with not only different bosses visually, but also different boss rooms and even slightly different mechanics in some cases. It also had the unique effect of transforming your race. While Caverns of Time dungeons in the past have visually changed your race, this was the first time your race actually got changed, force changing your racials. The Champion of Light, Grog, and Jade Fire Masters fights were all different between Horde and Alliance. The Jade Fire Masters, for example's trash, and the fight itself being famously much easier for Alliance than Horde. Then comes the fight Opulence, Conclave of the Chosen, the King Rastakhan, Horde members would be transformed into Alliance and replay the Alliance attack. While the Alliance would be transformed into the Horde to replay the Horde retaliation during the High Tinker Mechatork, Stormwind Blockade, and the Lady Jaina Proudmoore fights. This was super unique and overall an amazing storytelling aspect, something I would love to see used more often in the future. Maybe even with Lady Slavana's fight being slightly different for Horde members who chose to support her in BFA? Hmm? Now on to dates and times. The raid released January 29th, 2019, and Jaina finally died after 346 wipes 7 days later on February 5th. Completing the meta achievement gave the Dazar Alor Wind Reaver, but the raid itself has amazing mounts as drops. First, the Gmod, a replica of Gallywix's blinged out mech suit, including a massive engravement on its face and its shield dropping from High Tinker Mechatork. The next mount is the Glacial Tide Storm, a water slash ice elemental drop from Jane on Mythic. It was guaranteed when it was current, but now it's only a 1% drop. Which by the way, later in BFA's lifespan, Blizzard made a hotfix, which caused this and the rest of the BFA final bosses Mythic mounts to drop two at a time instead of one, doubling the amount raids could get each week. The Crucible of Storm, our first two boss raid in a long time, and also a very hard one of that. Releasing April 23rd, it took until May 3rd to get beat. With over 700 pulls, it took 9 days to go down. Who would have thought that a raid with only 2 bosses would be so hard? Although to be fair, the reason the wipe count was so high was because of a phase 1 mechanic that could wipe the raid very quickly if the 6 people at Winton touched each other. And since this super deadly mechanic was an early phase 1 mechanic, it racked up an inflated amount of wipes for all world first raiders until it was hotfixed. Next, we have the Eternal Palace. Releasing July 16th, it took 12 days for Ajar to be defeated, ending on July 28th. This raid overall was seen poorly by the community, with a few rather annoying fights, like the ones with Orgoza having a maze, Radiance of Ajar being an annoying mess of tornadoes, and Blackwater Behemoth, which, ironically, was one of the rather well-liked fights and was completely underwater. And then Queen Ajara herself, the first boss in many years to require the player to actively use line of sight mechanics for most of the mechanics for the fight. And that did not go over well for players, especially healers trying to heal people on the other side of pillars. The raid had the Ajari Bloat Ray from its meta achievement, but didn't have any random drop mounts. Last to BFA, Nihiloth of the Waking City, its meta achievement granting the Wriggling Parasite mount, the final boss Nizoth dropping the Nihiloth all seer on Mythic only. Again, guaranteed to drop one, later two on kill, but reduced to 1% drop rate with the pre-patch. And the head of the curve mount the spawn of Vexinoa, given to players who killed Nazoth and Heroic before the launch of the Shadowlands pre-patch. Now, how did the raid go? Well, overall, the raid was good, but the new corruption system introduced kind of ruined how a lot of people felt about the place. 
and especially with an old god going down so easily, it angered a lot of the player base. Although, it seems a lot of people forget that shooting anything with a beam intended to glass an entire planet, made to destroy old gods in case they infected the planet, is likely to kill it, no matter if it's a powerful old god or not. So, with the raid releasing January 28th, 2020, Nazoth the Corruptor, the final old god of Azeroth, would find himself vaporized Kamehameha style after only 10 days, February 6, 2020. Cool fact, this was the first ever world first end boss killed by US in over 8 years. As for the last 8 years before this, EU had a much better time. Maybe in part to Complexity Limit running a 21 man raid roster. Maybe go look up the video on that, but gist of it is instead of having the raid lead in the raid, they are focused 100% on raid leading by watching the raid through their streams, so they can focus on what needs to be done by who without worrying about doing their own stuff and doing a rotation. Another fun fun fact, this is the first raid ever that has required players to have their legendary to beat it, as engaging Azoth without the legendary cape would have the player near instantly mind controlled turning them against their allies. Which was an interesting experience when Nazoth finally opened up for LFR Raiders. Now onto the current expansion, Shadowlands. Castle of Nathria is the first raid of the expansion. The raid only had one mount, the Rampart Screecher, from completing the meta achievement. The expansion released on October 26, 2020, and the raid released on December 8, 2020. The final boss, Sire Denathris, was finally killed on December 23rd. It took a fair while. For a first raid of an expansion, Castle of Nathria proved itself to actually be quite hard. Well worth the Vampire Lord himself, though. Now, for the final raid launched at the time of this video, the Sanctum of Domination, which is not out yet. However, it will be launching on July 6, with the Mythic launch the next week on July 13th. So obviously, as the raid has not come out yet, we can't really talk about what was killed first or how long it took. So for now, we all just have to wait and see how long all that takes. But what we can talk about is the mounts. With three mounts, the raid is rather well off. The Sanctum Gloom Charger dropping from the Nine, and Vengeance, a Moth-themed Dragonhawk, a manifestation of Sylvanas' want and need for vengeance, acting as the 100% mythic drop mount from Sylvanas' Windrunner. Like all others, going to be reduced to 1% come the next expansion after Shadowlands. The final mount being the Hand of Hrestmurak, a giant hand mount granted to players who complete the meta achievement for the raid. But it's been quite a while since we've had a legendary weapon drop from a raid, and who better to drop one than Sylvanas herself, with her rare Shalair's Death Whisper, our first legendary weapon in 10 years. Hunters using this bow gain a new ability, allowing them to fire a wailing arrows that damages and silences in an AoE, just like her ability in Heroes of the Storm, while also having a back that hunters can equip with the appearance of a quiver, giving them a withering arrow passive, again like her Heroes of the Storm ability. And while we're at it, we might as well mention the Edge of Night Dagger, which works for rogues, applying a debuff that deals damage and finishing moves deal more damage as the enemy's health gets lower. Also, as the years went on, we got time walking in Warlords of Draenor, allowing players to replay old dungeons, scale down to somewhat relevant power levels for their respective plays. However, as expansions went on, we got more and more expansions, eventually even getting time walking raids, allowing us to replay old raids as they were currently. Sort of, being Black Temple, Old War, and Firelands. Black Temple time walking allowing players to earn the Warglaive's transmog for the Demon Hunters, even eventually introducing a limited time event for the 15th year anniversary, having raid groups do small fractions of key moments and raids of the past. Lady Vash, Kalthos, and Archimon for TBC, Hagen, Anubarak, and Arthas for Wrath of the Lich King, Cho'gal, Nefarian, and Ragnaros for Cataclysm. Upon completing all of these iconic bosses of the past, the players would be given the memories of Fell Frost and Fire Achievement, granting them the Ossidian Worldbreaker mount, a mount with a huge resemblance to Deathwing, an amazing celebration of 15 years of WoW. And of course, with Classic having been introduced, many of the raid times were just destroyed. Karazhan, Magtheridon's Lair, Gruul's Lair all having been cleared within 48 hours of launch. Classic really has shown how much player base of WoW has grown, and how much we have metagamed everything to the utmost of optimization. So I would love to go over that, but it's rather depressing how quickly some of these impossibly difficult, going to take forever to clear raids were actually cleared in Classic, with I think even one of them being cleared after an hour after it launched. Now as mentioned above, this video would be way too long if we went in depth over everything. So we didn't mention skips, which for example, raids are very long, and so many of them had unlockable skips. Killing specific bosses on a difficulty would eventually allow you to skip right to the boss in future weeks. In places like Castle Nathria, Hellfire Citadel, and Blackrock Foundry, this made reclearing the raid no longer necessary when you only wanted the final couple bosses. 
But if you wanted any specific info on something mentioned, you can easily search the channel to see if we have a video on it, which we'll likely do, like History of Hard Modes for example, or the Top 10 Vehicle Fights, or History of Legendaries, Easiest Mounts videos, and more. All things that cover specifics of the raids that we had to skim over in this video.